Okay. The um Tzchukas Bolak and uh course Pashas begins with the law of Paraduma, the red cow that was slaughtered and uh, burnt and whose ashes was coupled with the living waters and was sprinkled on a person who became Tame twice during the seven day period. And, and uh, then he went to the mikveh and became tar and he became pure. He beca originally became contaminated because he came in contact with a human corpse. Um, and, and or in the room uh, with a human corpse. And the, the halacha was that as a result, as result of this contact or association or being within this proximity, so this person was not allowed to come in contact with holy things. He was not allowed to enter the temple, the base Hamikdash, until he went through the purification process. And the using of the ashes of the paraduma combined with the sprinkle, the, 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 the water, the living waters that were sprinkled upon him. So he would, he would then be allowed to resume his former uh, form of life and going to the base of Mikdash and going to the temple and coming in contact with Truma and coming in contact with Kachim with the, with the uh, uh, holy things and the, the, the whole process of the Paraduma is identified in the Torah as Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the decree of the Torah. And there is a Medrash brought down different ways, but more or less, the Medrash says, well, first Rashi mentions that the nations of the world, Monines Yisrael, Monines Yisrael, in a sense, they torture, the Jew, not physical torture, psychological torture. Matam le mitzvah zu. What is the reason for this mitzvah? Can you explain? They come to us sometimes not saying, oh, the mitzvah doesn't make sense. There are times, as we'll see on other Midrashim, that they come and say the, the mitzvah doesn't make sense. But there are times when they put on a face, oh, we are interested in learning from you. When in truth, they are interested in destroying our perspective, our religious perspective. And this is, this is the... Uh, so man in es Yisrael, ma tam le mitzvah. So what is the reason for this mitzvah? But at other times, they come out openly. As the Medrash tells us about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he was asked by a non-Jew, a heathen, an Ovde Avodah about Paraduma. And they said, what is this about Paraduma? You take a cow, a red cow, you grind it, and you take the ashes and sprinkle two or three drops upon the to complete it with the with living waters, and then you sprinkle a couple drops on the person who came contaminated because of contact with somebody that was dead. What type of witchcraft is this? 
And so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, according to the way the Medrash is brought down, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said to them, he said, what do you do when a demon enters a person? And uh, they, uh, so they, they take all kinds of things, herbs, whatever it might be, uh, make a fire. And, uh, and this is the way they, so to say, get rid of the demon. So Rabbi Yochab ben Zakeh says, more or less, that that's what we're doing also. Our way is no different than yours. So when they came, when they heard, uh, so the person left, and when the person left, the Talmudian, the students of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, they said to him, okay, you were able to tell him that, but what are you going to tell us? How are you going to explain paraduma rationally to us? And he said to them, in an answer for them, he says, the Torah says, Zoskuk has the Torah. This is the command of the Torah. This is the decree. And the question is, was so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai explained in two ways. In the first way, he compared it to the approach that the Umos Solom, the nations of the world had. When someone is overtaken, what they consider by a demon. Now, I will try to be rational. And I would say that when he said that to overtake him by a demon, he meant to say it was a form of mental illness. And all kinds of methods were used. I'll get into that a little bit later. But then he turns to the students after this, this idolatrous person left the room. And he tells the students, for you, so has the Torah. This is the command of the Torah. So was he lying? When he told them, when he told them, that he compared it to what they would do if a demon entered somebody. It's hard to believe that Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai would be telling a non-truth. I could understand it perhaps if Rabbi Yochanan, if the Medrash would tell us they held a gun to his head and they were ready to execute him because of his involvement in witchcraft. But that hardly seems to be the case. So, how are we to understand Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai explaining it one way and then implying to his students that what he said to them was not true? Now, we have to understand the Rambam in Moran Nebuchadnezzar he gives Tameh HaMitzvos. He gives Tameh HaMitzvos also in rare cases to Mentahara being one of them in the Yad HaZaka. 
But in Yad HaChazaka, he's very limited in the Tom Hammond's post, in the reasons, in the explanation of, for the mitzvahs. And he had a chazok, he focuses primarily on Jewish law. Every once in a while, he will suggest a moral lesson that he deduced from Tum and Tahara. Thank you. From the, from the mitzvahs, excuse me, from the mitzvahs, Tum and Tahara, I think the Rambam says, <laughs> There's nothing actual physical. And we have to understand that sometimes we have an improper thought. We don't do anything, no action. But it has a lasting impact upon us. But in Mordechai, the Rambam, tries to explain most of the mitzvahs are Torah. Some of them or some parts of them, he says he doesn't understand. What's interesting is his attitude towards Tommy and mitzvahs. And for that matter, his attitude, purpose he saw in Mora Nebuchim in general. We know. And Mar Nebuchim, he dealt with the philosophical questions. Is Talmud Rav Yosef, who he essentially wrote the Mar Nebuchim for, of course, when the Rambam wrote the Mar Nebuchim, he didn't mean it only for Rav Yosef, his Talmud Rav Yosef. But he meant it for everybody else, but he wrote it in the form was something he was reading, writing for his students, Rabbi Yosef, who, who, of course, besides being a great scholar in, in learning in Torah, was also very well versed in philosophy. And the Rambam discusses a lot of the philosophical issues that he felt was necessary to discuss. And the Rambam focuses on many psukim and words in Tanakh and explaining it. And he focuses so in the last chalik of Marinavuchem on trying to explain many of the mitzvahs of the Torah. And regarding the halacha of ayin pachasayin, an eye for an eye, so the Rambam says that uh, regarding the halacha of ayin pachasayin, the, the Rambam says that that the the um, that a person who put out the eye of his friend deserves to have his eye taken out. In other words, he interprets the words of the Torah very literally. And the Rambam himself understood that someone reading these comments in his Sefer, in the Moran of Uchem, will immediately be confronted with the problem that our sages say, Ayin Pachasayin is Mamon, that one who has puts out the eye of another person has to pay, make certain payments for the physical damage that he did. So, so and the Ram says 
the purpose of this book, Mar Nevochem, is to explain the Torah Shabbat Sab, the written Torah, not the Torah Shabbat Peh, not the oral Torah. And it's interesting, the Rambam and Mar Nevochem says that the, when the, the money, the, pay, the requirement to pay money is in placement, so to say, of having of having of having been required to have his eye taken out. Not that Khasvashama would take out his eye in any case. It's, the Rambam says, so it seems from the Rambam that his that there was a purpose and a function in explaining Torah Shabbat even, even it's in a simple manner, even when it, the simple explanation does not conform to the halacha. And we know that the Rambam constantly says, that anyone who rejects the halacha bayin tachasayin is going against the Messorah. And we know the Ram says that those who go against the Messorah, they reject the words of our sages. They are considered like an, an apichorus. Heretics. So even though in practice we have to know what our sages tell us, and we have to believe that that was what was given by God to Moshe at Mount Sinai. Nevertheless, the fact that the Torah Shabbat was written in a particular manner and in a particular fashion. From the perspective of Liman HaTorah, there is significance in understanding the simple explanation. So the question is, what, what is that simple explanation? So, uh, 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 the, in other words, the Torah tells us what the person deserved. Because if a person is aware of how severe the consequences of his not being careful is, he would be more careful. But the, the purpose of Mar Nevochim is to understand the Torah Shabbat. It's not a halachic sefer. It's not a book of Jewish law. Perhaps we could say it's, it has lessons for us. And it's interesting that the Rambam In explains in the Moran of Vuchim the Tamea mitzvahs, the reasons for the mitzvahs. So, in a sense, we have three elements in the Moran of Vuchim. We have the philosophical, the biblical, and the Tamea mitzvahs. So, the Tamea mitzvahs are identified. with the Torah Shebech Sav, because the purpose of the Mor Nebuchad, the Rambam says, is to explain the Torah Shebech Sav. The written Torah.
Now it's the now the Torah Shabbat. What is the difference between the Torah Shabbat, the written Torah, and the oral Torah? I think the Torah Shabbat is there for the whole world to see. Remember, the Torah Shabbat pad, the oral Torah originally was not allowed to be taught in a text in public. It was something that was hidden from the world. But the Torah Shabbat that was open for the whole world to see. So the question is, the, 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 so, so I would suggest that perhaps the idea of the Tamaham Mitzvos, which is identified with the Torah Shabbat Sabbath, is the approach to Torah, that when we have to explain Torah to non-Jews, we explain it from the perspective of the Torah Shabbat Sab, and not from the perspective of Torah Shabbat Pad, unless there's a special reason, either halachically or because of the situation that we have to explain it to them. And it's very interesting, the, the, the Ramah, in Shuvah Yud, the Shuvah Ramah, one of the seven mitzvahs in Noah is Dina. A civil code. And the Ramad discusses the question that non-Jews are, are required to follow a civil code. Do they have to follow the civil code of the Torah or not? Or they can adopt an independent civil code. And that's why most of the Mepharshim assume that as a double portion, that the, the non Jews don't have to follow the civil code of the Torah, but they have to follow, they have to adopt the civil code and follow that civil code. Even if that civil code, so long as that civil code is fair, of course, if it's a civil code that is totally unfair, then that's no civil code. That's not Dina. So, but the Ramah makes it dependent upon a machlokis, a marayim, and Many ask the question, I think it's also brought down either that Reb Chaim Volozhner asked this question or Reb Vitzel because it says, Magid Varav Liachov, Chu Kavim Mishpat of the Yisrael, Lo Asachein L'chog Goy, U Mishpatim Bal Yodum. God did not make the Mishpatim known to the nations of the world. How could the nations of the world be required in the civil code? Well, there are two possibilities we could say. One possibility is we see by a, a Gertosha, a real Gertosha, who is Mexidi Umasola. So he should observe the Shiva Mitzvah Ben Noach because it was commanded in the Torah that it should be observed. They can observe the Shiva Mitzvah B'nai Noach because to them it's rational, logical. But the pious of the world, they should observe it, the Shiva Mitzvah, the seven mitzvahs, 
because it was given in the Torah. So we could say, obviously, this responsibility, observing the Shiva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, that began, that began when the Torah was given. If we to say that that the that it's to be observed at that point, so that can only be for the point that Torah was given. So a person could suggest that So yes, according to that opinion, you have to observe the civil law of the Torah. But it wasn't revealed to them. They have to get it from the Jewish people. But we can also suggest that their, their requirement of civil law, observe the civil law, is they could fulfill that part of the requirement by observing the mitzvot in the Torah Shabbat Shabbat. Because to a certain degree, the Torah Shabbat Shabbat was revealed to the whole world. doesn't mean that the civil code has to be limited to that. And it could be if they follow certain laws of Torah Shabbat Path, that wouldn't be a problem either. But their basic requirement could be, according to that opinion, which we don't pass to right, to, to observe the Torah Shabbat Shabbat, the civil code of the Torah Shabbat Shabbat. Because that was, in a sense, revealed to the whole world. True, it was given only to the Jewish people. It's interesting that it said, says Rabbi Vega disagrees, but then from the Nitzib it appears that the prohibition of teaching a non-Jew Torah only applies to the Torah Shabbat. It does not apply to the Torah Shabbat Shabbat. These are questions that always come up. There are other answers. When we study, when somebody wants them to go Geras, how do we study with them? And there are all kinds of different opinions and different approaches. So we could suggest now, So in a sense, if Tameh mitzvos are to be associated with the understanding of Torah Shabbat Shabbat, as the Rambam says, we could suggest that the giving of Tameh mitzvos, even though Tameh mitzvos is not part and parcel of the halacha. But for perhaps for a non-Jew, where the time is an obvious time, it might play a role even in his way of understanding from a halachic perspective of understanding the Torah. Okay, this is good in regard to the Shiva Mitzvah B'nai Noach. But Paraduma is not a halacha that has anything to do with the Shiva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, with the seven Noachite laws. But in explaining when there is a need, there is a discussion whether you could explain to a non-Jew 
there seems to have been two translations of the Rambam and his Chuvos uh, explaining to a non-Jew some of the mitzvahs of Torah that they're not required in. Whether it's if one is allowed to teach non-Jews uh, the mitzvahs of the Torah, where they're not required. So we could suggest that's perhaps what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakei was trying to tell them. In other words, it's true. Now my uncle says, Paraduma, he says, there are three approaches, three possibilities uh, in understanding mitzvahs. There is the why of the halacha. He says that we almost never understand. The how of the halacha, certainly by paraduma, we don't understand how it's matir, how it's not matir. But the what, what we can learn from it. You see, Ramosha Darshan, Rashi brings down, he tries to explain paraduma. Shlomo HaMelech on one hand said he couldn't understand it. And Ramosha Darshan explains it. How, how we can understand that. But there is a lesson. We don't understand the why. We don't understand how. But we can understand the lesson of Paragun. And that was what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was telling them. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was telling them that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was telling them that that when you speak about you speak about demons and you have all kinds of ritual, or don't call it ritual, call it uh, your your forms of medicine to rid people of their demons of their mental illness of coping with all kinds of hallucinations. My father told me that his grandfather, Abelia Prussian, my father's mother's father, he was the uncle of Ramosha Feinstein. He was the Rav of Prussian. And, and he, he uh, there was once a girl in Prussian that, had, that people claimed had a dibbut in her. So Rebellia Prusina called had her come to his house and he had a Besden there. And the Besden, the Besden commanded the Dibok to leave her. This is the story my father told me. My father said Rebellia Prusina was a psychologist. He understood that if he told the girl she didn't have a dibuk, it would never have made an oppression on her. But it was becoming impossible to live with her and she couldn't even live with herself because of the dibuk that was within her or that she perceived was within her. And because of that, he called this Besden together and the Besden gave her the command. Dibuk, leave. Talked with the Dibuk first, whatever it is, and out of the girl's mouth, whatever the discussion was. And the Dibuk, the Dibuk left, and everything was okay. So my father said, Belly Prussia was a smart person. He was a born psychologist. Today, psychologists, when they deal with multiple personalities, they use the opposite approach. They try to merge the personalities. Rebellia Prishna and his, uh, I guess, <laughs> his approach to psychology was to chase out the other personality. Okay, whatever it is. 
So that's that's what my impression is. That that's how my father explained it. Now, I have a, a very close friend who is a third cousin of mine, and his grandmother. His grandmother was a niece of Rebellion Persia. And when I repeated the story to him, and I told him my father's explanation, about the Dibbuk. So he said that he heard the same story from his grandmother. She apparently was in rebellion prisoner's house at that time. And she told him that after the Dibbuk left, everybody pointed to a hole in the window. Many pointed to a hole in the window. And they said, that's the hole that the Dibbuk left the house through. In fact, I know there are people today seem somewhat irrational. But today, people are irrational. That if you close up, if you close up a window, they come up with all kinds of nonsense that you have to leave a small hole there. So to shade him, or did book him, or whatever, uh, should be able to get out of the house. It's a form of shaded busters, or did book busters. Okay. Now, there are probably people that that would be a good approach for. But today, I think, I think today that would not be the uh, the best approach to use, uh, but the the uh, and I think that the, when the people when some of the people were pointing to the hole in the window, I assume that that story is his true story because the people that gave it over were certainly very honest people. The rebellion person have felt that if he would tell them what he really did. It would have been counterproductive because undoubtedly it was a, probably a small crowd in the house at the time. And somebody would have told it to the girl and the Dibbuk would have returned. So rebellion Prussian probably just kept quiet and he might have even actually initiated someone to say, look at the hole in the window. So that would reinforce his cure. So my guess is to understand Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, I think Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai wasn't lying. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he understood. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai understood that the purpose of uh, the Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai understood that Zos Kukasa Torah, this is a command. But Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai also understood, yes, it's a command. And we don't know why HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us this command. And we don't know the reason for the, for the details of this command. Of course, many Farshim explain different details. But besides the command, the command served the purpose the command, because very often when people came in contact with the dead, especially when it was a close relative, and I've seen it in my rabbinical career also, people are overcome with psychological issues. And it's to be understood. There's depression. There's a sense of guilt. And the idea that the death lingers on with the person who came in contact. And usually it's a close person who's in the room when a person dies and where people die. Of course, that's not the reason for the halakha, and the halakha is not limited to those situations. 
but it helps us because every person, when they lose a close relative, to a certain extent, they lose contact with reality. My uncle once explained the halacha that a nonon is part of from mitzvah sase, is exempt from mitzvah sase, because that's the natural situation. You lose a certain degree of contact with reality when a close relative dies and the period of Aninus is between the burial, between the death and the burial. And you can't think straight. The halach is a shota. A person who doesn't have contact with reality is not required in mitzvahs. Perhaps it emphasizes the point to him that he's in a state which normally is identified with a lack of contact with reality. Nothing to be ashamed about. That's just the way things are. But sometimes we need a closure. And it could be that paraduma served. How it served to that closure, I've discussed many times. But it could be that paraduma served as a form of closure. But of course, the reason we do it. The reason we do it is not because of the closure, not because of the psychological necessity. We do it because this is the command of the Torah. But when we teach the Torah Shabbat Sab and we explain the mitzvahs of Torah Shabbat Sab to the non Jews, we have to explain it from the perspective. The general perspective of the Maranavuchim. Explain it with the Tamim mitzvos, the Tamim that are not necessarily the why and the how, but the what. And especially when it comes to Paraduma. When it comes to Paraduma, the why and the how are beyond us. And the what becomes even more important. So, I think what Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai said was correct. But his Talmudim needed to know the why. And for them, the why was Zos Lukas Torah. This is the command of the Torah. And Reb Chaim would always say, and I've mentioned it before, Reb Chaim would say, the Zohar says, God looked in the Torah and created the world. People who give Tamim mitzvahs, People who try to explain the mitzvahs from a rational perspective. So they always show how the Torah gives us the ability to adapt to what is happening in the world, to nature, to psychological nature, physical nature. Relationships. Rav Chaim says it's just the reverse. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he created the world with the psychological nature that people have, with the physical nature of the world, he created in such a way that it should accommodate the Torah. This was the answer that Rav Yochan ben Zake told his Talmudim. What I told them wasn't false, it's true. 
but you have to know it emanates from Zostul Kasa Torah. It started with the law of the Torah. And because Istatl B'Taraso Baralamo, because God looked in the Torah and created the world. That's why, that's why the, the world was created in such a way that closure it plays a role that, that the paraduma could serve as a form of closure for people who are affected, who come in contact with the, with the death of a relative or death in general, because coming in contact with death even not of a relative, unless we can somehow deal with it, could make one very despondent, because we know that the end, that, that in a sense, that is the end of all of man. Okay. Hi, uh, Ramosha, there are a few questions sure. in the chat. Uh, the first one is, do we find cases by Kabbalah different than Halacha? When you, you mean, how, you, I'm not sure what the question is. Do we find cases where the minig is different? I don't know. Uh, uh, Danny, uh, Danny, you want to uh, elaborate on your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Let me uh, unmute you, Danny. Hold on. Okay. Okay, Danny, I ask you to unmute. Danny, you can unmute yourself. Still not hearing you? Okay, you can talk, Danny. Danny? Different minhag. There are different minhagim in the, in the Zohar. However, there seems to be different opinions about it. The, uh, the Gra, the Rebchaim Valashner brings down the name of the Vilna Goen that the the uh, the Zohar does not disagree with the halacha the way we, we, we have accepted it. Sometimes it, it is a midas chsidus. Sometimes it adds a point. But his feeling was that there are no real conflicts between Kabbalah and halacha. That was the opinion of the Vilna Goen. However, and by the way, this gives special prominence to the, uh, to the perspective of the halacha from the Vilna Goen's perspective, to, 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 excuse me, to, to Kabbalah, because you have to understand the halacha from a, a, a Kabbalah perspective, and the reverse, of course, is also true. But you have to deal with each situation. Uh, the 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 but there are those that seem to suggest that the war differences of opinion and under certain circumstances one can follow the opinion of of the of the Kabbalah. I think there are those that suggest that in the Lubavitch, but I might be wrong. So because uh, they suggest that the the Balatanya Shulchan Aruch was not influenced that much by Kabbalah, whereas the Psachim he gave in the Siddur were influenced by Kabbalah. And they say that the Shulchan Aruch was written for the Misnagdim and the Siddur was written for the Hasidim. Now, whether that's an official quote or just something I've heard some Lubavitchers say, I don't, you know, I don't know. Okay, uh, there's another question. Uh, this is that do we have an obligation when voting 
for political office to vote for candidates who support positions that are what nine Jews are obligated to follow. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Seven, uh, the, uh, the seven allegations. I, I assume that they're talking about, probably are talking about abortion. Could be. Yeah. Uh, that, let me just put it this way. That certainly should play a factor. I don't know that it's the only factor. You know, as we have to take other concerns into mind also, we have to take the position of Israel into mind. We have the responsibility for Israel. So there are other issues that have to be taken into mind, but that should also play a, a role. And I think, let me add, uh, that that perhaps is more a, a more important role than uh, who, which one is going to give more money to to our institutions. But they they all play a role. They're all factors to be considered. Um, I don't believe. There are any other questions? So thank you very much for Moshe and thank you everybody else for joining us. And uh, we look forward to hearing Sure next week. Yes, we'll have Sure next week or Moshe. Uh, let's see, next week, probably not, probably not. But uh, no. we, if there will be Sure, we'll send out a notice. In two okay. weeks will be there, okay? okay? Okay, thank you, Moshe. Thank you everybody else for joining us and uh, should be chazer over the uh, shear and uh, be able to, get, to learn whatever it is uh, that, uh, that uh, you need to learn. Hey, have a good week, everybody. Be yeah, well. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, probably going to be in New York someday. So that's, uh... Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Have a safe trip. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Well,